Starting off with the trouble with the 2011 Oscars, which was infamously hosted by Anne and James Franco, well, it started well before showtime. The messy showcase has gone down in history as one of the worst Academy Award ceremonies of all time. Not the worst, but it's up there. When it came time to film stuff for the show ahead of time, Anne showed up ready to play, she was committed 110%, and James was described as being a great guy, but uh, looked like he just woke up for a nap. Somebody described it as, you know, you're showing up to a tennis court, one person decided that they were going to play in the US Open, the other one just wanted to play in jeans and maybe hit a couple of balls. A source who wrote for the live telecast says that he remembers hearing that the friction started when Anne decided to offer James Franco a stray acting note during rehearsals. She was like, hey, maybe you should try that. And he was like, mm. Don't tell me how to be funny. Yeah, it's no surprise they never cemented any kind of bond. Watching it was like the world's most uncomfortable blind date between the cool stoner kid and the adorable theater camp cheerleader. Apparently they've, you know, kissed made up now, but that all just sounds like the worst combination of creative hell possible. I'm fully aware that quoting Howard Stern is low hanging fruit, but he's the walking definition of someone who has managed to make a career out of being a hater, and well, that was relevant for today. During an interview with <laughs> James Franco, he said, Everyone sort of hates Anne Hathaway, and I've explained that I do too, and I don't even know why sometimes. She's just so affected and actressy that even when she wins an award, she's out of breath. And then she has a standard joke that sounds like it's been written for her, and it all seems so scripted and acted. She comes off like the goody two shoes actress and is just sort of fun to hate her. Howard went on to add, hate is a strong word, but I dislike her even though she's a great actress. Is that accurate? James was like, well, I'm not an expert on half the haters, but I think that's what maybe triggers it. Wow. Talk about the pot calling the cow black. Not only that, but he had the audacity to talk about the disastrous Oscars hosting together, making it sound like she was the one who came begging to become friends with him again instead of the other way around. Let the history book show he's the one who begged her to host with him. In the years leading up to Judd Apatow's Knocked Up, Anne Hathaway had proven herself to be one of the industry's most exciting rising stars. Seeing as before this she'd done Brokeback Mountain, Devil Wears Prada, Princess Diaries, she was becoming more and more sought after by the minute. Her prowess, her undeniable charm, they captivated this director's attention, and he was like, hmm. I think she's the perfect lead for my rom-com. But she backed out last minute after part of the script was like not meshing with her. This was the scene that depicted a woman explicitly giving birth and Anne was like, I think this is unnecessary to the storyline. In her own words, I turned down Knocked Up because it was going to show a vagina. Not mine, but somebody else's. And I didn't believe that it was necessary to the story. Now, yes, the director did say there's no bad blood now, but apparently back in the day that wasn't the case. Leaving a director scrambling last minute isn't the girl boss move Anne thought it was. And it only added to her diva reputation, which I'll touch on more in a moment. Looking back, movies like Knocked Up were kind of like the epitome of early 2000s romantic comedies that were very much a product of the times. And while a lot of folks still appreciate such films, yeah, you can't deny the oddly unsettling storylines, the dated language, all of which perfectly reflect some of the era's biggest shortcomings regarding societal acceptance and inequality. Richard Lawson of the Atlantic Wire told Hollywood.com that Hathaway has this theater kid thing where she adopts the mood of every situation she's in. Rude and body on Chelsea lately, poised and classy at the Oscars, but wildly overcompensating every single time. Now he continued on, like that wasn't all he had to say. She always seems like she's performing and her favorite act is this overstated humility and gracious. Business. On the other hand, writer Victoria Wellman is one half of the Oratory Laboratory, a site that helps craft client speeches. And part of Anne's problem is just the actress is one of those people who doesn't really come off as sincere. Take for example her award show speeches. I've talked about it a bit today. The whole point of award shows is that nobody knows who's going to win, and you know, the audience counts on that element of surprise to be part of a winner's speech. But Anne's words of gratitude came off as way too rehearsed, not the usual like, oh my god! And the more you rehearse something, the more kind of presumptuous it comes across. Like, yes, we are used to seeing actors act, but we do want to see a glimpse of their personality. So when it came to the Golden Globe speech, it was just very word for word. So, is she just a phony after all? Or is she someone who wants desperately to fit in and she's trying her best? I'll let you decide in the comments. I don't think Matt Lauer is on the top of anybody's most liked list these days, and it's pretty obvious why. But hey, back in the day when this man was still employed on the Today Show, he had a pretty icky interaction with Andy that needs to be noted. So, 2012, Anne's on a press tour for Les Mis, and ugh, a photographer crouched down as she got out of a car, and he got an upskirt photo. Which was a horrifically sleazy thing for this pap to do. But then Anne was a guest on Today, and Matt was like, hmm. That's a you problem. Specifically, he opened it with, like, nice to see you. And then, seen a lot of you lately. Now, Anne did her best. She tried to play it off as though he's talking about the oversaturated press cycle. She's just like, yeah, you know, I'd be happy to stay home, but the film, like, she's doing her best. 
And uh, Buddy's like, mm mm mm, let's just get it out of the way. You had a little wardrobe malfunction the other night. And like, he raised his eyebrows. Like, she's right there. And the guy's just like, mm hmm. What's the lesson learned from something like that? Other than you keep smiling, which you always do. It was just so icky and gross. Ugh, men. Now, Anne's response was very, very graceful. She was like, it was obviously an unfortunate incident, and it kind of made me sad on two accounts. One was that I was very sad where we live in an age where somebody takes a picture of another person in a vulnerable moment, and rather than delete it and do the decent thing, they sell it. And she's like, I'm sorry that we live in a culture that commodifies the sexuality of unwilling participants. And she's like, that brings us back to Les Mis. Like, very good. The fact that the conversation even acknowledges the fact that what happened to her was a violation of privacy, but an attempt to humiliate her for the fact of possessing a female body? Ugh, it just hurts my brain. Matt frames the conversation as though what happened to her was an error on her part that she's got to learn a lesson from. And just his way of doing it and his instinct to raise the question in the first place reinforces this awful ideology where women's bodies are both inherently humiliating and public property. It's this ideology that helps perpetrate a culture in which men can just, you know, harass and do whatever they want to women in private and get away with it. And well, now that we know about Matt, I'm not surprised. Anne has had a couple of other stories come out about her supposed diva behavior, by the way. For one instance, uh, she reportedly sent a list of demands before agreeing to attend the Pink Party Gala, which was a cancer research charity event. According to Radar Online, an email to those working the gala says her team was getting really concerned that people would try to approach her for photos and autographs. Now, they've said like other celebrities who would be attending didn't make those kinds of demands. One source told In Touch that everybody was asked to not talk to her. And apparently the event staff was like, yeah, I know in the past our hosts have mingled at the party, but everybody's different and we want to respect her space. And sure, people respected her space, but it seemed like she still wasn't having a good time. This always revealed she was so rude and acted like a B-I-T-C-H to a couple of people that she did speak to. She just sat there rolling her eyes all night. Not a good move, girl. Anne was apparently a nightmare to deal with for an onset chef, setting back her breakfast multiple times. For context, she was shooting a commercial on the Paramount lot and she wanted to order an English muffin, a poached egg, and an avocado for breakfast. TMZ reported that she sent the dish back not one, not two, four times. So the first time the meal was brought to her, apparently the poached egg was too runny. So sent it back. And then the next time, now her English muffin is too cold because it was sitting there waiting for the egg to be poached. Okay, I guess she has to have all of her food together at the same time in order to eat. So then her English muffin was taken away, but maybe she just didn't eat it? Nevertheless, it looks like it went to waste for no good reason. Now, fourth time around, the meal's perfect. But apparently it took so long that now Anne was in the mood for a fried egg. So she wasted this entire meal that she originally wanted just to change her mind. Not it. I don't like wasting food. So I know I've mentioned a couple of other journalists earlier today, but then there's still some notable ones that have also had some things to say about Anne, such as Anne Friedman, but not intended, who is well known for being an incredible journalist. This one stood out to me. She took a poll amongst peers about their opinions on Anne, and the results were not nice. She's that theater kid with good intentions, but secretly annoys the SHIT out of you. You want to be excited for her, but and like you are, but deep down, you're just rolling your eyes. And also, I think someone told her she was America's sweetheart and she believed it. One friend in particular placed Anne in the category of really affected drama queens, saying I can imagine her not ironically yelling acting. In other words, she's always on stage, always calculated, not someone whom you'd want to party with or share your deepest secrets. You can't trust her, that's not good. So way back before Margot Robbie was in the conversation to become the iconic Barbie we all know and love today, Anne was announced as being attached to the project, but then got ditched when it transferred from Sony to Warner. I wonder what the execs at Warner had against her unless they know something we don't. And how about we end today with Annie's poor choice and an ex-boyfriend, Raffaello Folieri. He went to prison in 2008 for four and a half years after he pleaded guilty in Manhattan federal court to 14 counts of conspiracy, wire fraud, and money laundering. Anne didn't break up with him until like right before he went to prison. And you've got to question her ethics for not breaking up with him sooner. Like, how did she not know this? Like, how did she not notice the guy was a scam artist? Like, I feel like that would have been obvious. John Schneider entered the country music scene in the 1980s, but you also might recognize him from the action comedy TV show Dukes of Hazard. John played one of the main characters, Bo Duke. John Schneider's first ever country album he released hit the stands and made it into the top 10 of the US country billboard charts, peaking at spot 8. He had even better standing with his cover slash remake of the Elvis hit Now or Never, which peaked at number 4 on the US country chart and 14 on the Hot 100 chart. All that intro to say, this guy is well established in the country music scene, and he is not happy that his territory has someone new coming in. In fact, he compared Beyonce
insight is something weird, definitely not something I would have picked myself. John Schneider was being interviewed on One America News Network, and soon the interview shifted to the recent controversy of an Oklahoma radio station refusing to play Beyonce's new country music when a fan requested it. The interviewer asked a question about Schneider's opinion on how the lefties in the entertainment scene have to seize control over every area in entertainment. Schneider agreed with the host, and that's where the odd comparison came in. John said, They've got to make their mark, just like a dog in a dog walk park. You know, every dog has to mark every tree, right? So that's what's going on here. That's right, John just compared Beyonce to a dog peeing on a tree. Obviously, Beyonce fans and people in general thought the comparison was a little bit rude. Many people on social media began pointing out that Beyonce had done country songs before and was revisiting that era. Others saying you can't gatekeep an entire genre of music. John did respond to the public criticism, saying that the phrase was just something he has always used. Safe to say that John Schneider and Beyonce will not be collaborating in the future. Kenny Chesney is incredibly successful in the country music scene. He has had multiple songs in the top 10 US Billboard Hot Country Songs charts and has received many awards for his contributions to the genre. His connection to Beyonce comes from a 2016 award show in which Beyonce performed a country song alongside the Dixie Chicks, and Kenny's seemingly unimpressed face was caught on camera. Beyonce has now stated that a main reason why she had written the country album was because she felt so unwelcome at the 2016 performance. When that info dropped, fans were quick to bring this Kenny video back as an example of why. In 2016, after receiving so much scrutiny online for his reaction, Kenny apologized and later clarified that he does love Beyonce's music. Kid Rock is not a Beyonce fan and hasn't been for a while. Kid Rock, or Robert James Ritchie, began his career and made it to mainstream media in the rap rock genre, but has now switched over to some more like country rock vibes. The singer has gone on record criticizing Beyonce's music and her appearance, saying she doesn't really do much for him. His criticisms came from his 2015 Rolling Stone interview in which he said he was flabbergasted by Beyonce's level of fame. He said, Beyonce, to me doesn't have a purple rain, but she's the biggest thing on earth. How can you be that big without at least one sweet home Alabama or old time rock and roll? He's right. By this point, Beyonce had only released songs like Single Ladies and Halo and Crazy in Love and more, songs that have had no lasting impact on pop culture at all and no one remembers at all either. Of course, fans of the Queen Bee weren't happy and began to swarm the comment sections of Kid Rock's Instagram with bee emojis, to which I will admit Kid Rock had a fun response posting a picture of a can of bug repellent. Do I agree with him? No. Was that a funny response? A little. These comments were said almost a decade ago, but I don't think we will ever see music from this pair. Accidental country artist Lil Wayne will probably not be collaborating with Beyonce anytime soon. Let me explain. Lil Wayne is a hip hop artist. He did release one song called You Dig that some people say has a country vibe, but it's not labeled as a country song by any means. Lil Wayne mainly has a feud with Jay Z, but since Beyonce is married to Jay Z, she is also kind of included in it. In one song, It's Good, Lil Wayne insinuates that Jay Z is living off Beyonce's money and that he might kidnap her, it's a choice. So that's the mini feud between him and Beyonce. The country part comes in in an odd way. At the American Music Awards, Lil Wayne won for the favorite rap slash hip hop song category for his track I'm the One, so he won one category, yet in the mail received five awards. The other four for the country genre. The award show accidentally sent him the awards meant for Lil Big Town, the famous country band. It was a mix up, Lil Wayne had nothing to do with their music, though if he were to collaborate with a country performer, he might choose them over Beyonce. We probably won't see a country collaboration between Carrie Hilson and Beyonce anytime soon, though Hilson has done country collabs in the past. Carrie is an American singer and songwriter that mainly performs the R&B genre, but has done some country once upon a time. She collaborated with country music stars Sugarland to perform the song Think by Aretha Franklin. While that country collab seemed right up her alley, one with Beyonce probably wouldn't be, as Carrie does not seem too fond of the Cowboy Carter writer. In 2009, Carrie released a remix of her single, Turn
turning me on. The original actually featured Lil Wayne. The remix didn't though, in which she rewrote the lyrics to the hook in Beyonce's song Irreplaceable. Lyrics in Beyonce's song are to the left, to the left, it's that one, and the lyrics in Carrie's version are you can dance, she can sing, but she needs to move it to the left, to the left, she needs some babies. In a 2013 interview with Juicy Magazine, Carrie allegedly refused to hold a magazine with Beyonce featured on the cover, so yeah, they weren't doing great then and they probably aren't now either. Though Keisha Cole is not a country music artist herself, she does seem to love the genre and actively wants to encourage artists breaking into it. The Grammy nominated singer once helped an up and coming country music talent Tony Evans Jr. get access to big name producers after she viewed one of the singer's videos posted online. So she clearly understands country talent when she hears it, but she is not a fan of Beyonce as of 2013. Beyonce released the song Bow Down in 2013 and Cole took her comments on the song to her Twitter account. She tweeted, first women need to stick together, now bees better bow down, shaking my head. Country fan 50 Cent is another one to have an eye on up and coming country talent. Though 50 Cent is a rapper, he has allowed his music to be turned into country songs, with country remixes being released online, and even Shang-Chi star Simu Liu performing a country version of his song Indie Club. It's safe to say though, the rapper might not traditionally write for the country genre. That doesn't mean he won't fit in. 50 Cent has shown public appreciation for country artists. Last year, country artist Zach Bryan attended a 50 Cent concert and later met 50 Cent afterwards. 50 Cent shared a photo to his personal Instagram of the pair sharing that Zach Bryan is the best new everything in country music, incredibly high praise. The rapper does not seem to hold Beyonce in such a high standard though. Allegedly in 2015, the rapper backed up Grammy producers when they decided to give Beck an award at the Grammys instead of Beyonce and insinuated that Beck poured more work into his album than Beyonce did. Azealia Banks is very much not on the Beyonce train and has not been for a while. She also recently insinuated that another female artist would have been a better pick to release some country tunes. The American rapper shared some thoughts on Beyonce after the release of her album Lemonade. Banks tweeted, Don't think for a second that Beyonce was intelligent enough to come up with any of those ideas on her own. Continuing with, She's not an artist, she's a poacher. Banks and Beyonce had a problem with each other back in 2014 when Banks released a remix of Beyonce's song Partition without permission. So Beyonce, well Beyonce's lawyers, filed a copyright claim against Banks. Now years later, with the release of Beyonce's country album, Banks has once again weighed in with her musical opinions, saying that she believes K. Michelle should be the one releasing country music instead. This was typed out on Banks' Instagram story. K. Michelle did respond with her ex-account, writing that she loves Beyonce and will be supporting her like she always does. So a K. Michelle and Beyonce collab seems way more likely than a Banks and Beyonce. In addition to all of this, Banks also used her social media to criticize the album cover for Cowboy Carter, so yeah, she really is not loving it. American rapper Kaya is not fond of Beyonce and has accused the Cowboy Carter singer of stealing music, copying music, and more using her social media. Kaya voiced her dislike for Beyonce's album Renaissance, calling it devil worshipping music. The pair's feud has been going on for years though, with Kaya notably referencing Beyonce in distasteful ways in some tracks. A future collab seems out of the question here. Lily Allen is a singer and songwriter from London and mainly releases music in the electro pop or reggae genres. That podcast is where she shared her opinions on Beyonce's country album. Talking to her co-host, one of Alan's big criticisms of the album was Beyonce's choice to cover the song Jolene. Alan said she found it weird. It's quite an interesting thing to do when you're trying to tackle a new genre and you just choose the biggest song in that genre to cover. Once again, referencing Jolene. I mean, you do you Beyonce and she literally is doing her. Or is she doing Dolly? Dolly Parton is actually all for Beyonce's cover, and all for the album in general. Dolly Parton is featured on two songs. She also once requested that Beyonce cover her song Jolene, the same way Whitney Houston covered her song I Will Always Love You. During a 2022 interview on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Parton was asked about her request, to which she replied, I don't know if she's even got the message, but wouldn't that be a killer? Parton says in the interview, I would just love to hear Jolene done in a big way, kind of like how Whitney did my I Will Always Love You, just someone that can take take my little songs and make them powerhouses. It seems Beyonce did get Dolly's message and we now have the amazing cover, but also Dolly Parton, please give yourself credit, the song is equally as amazing when you perform it. Lily Allen did have more opinions on the country album to share, she said she viewed the entire thing as very calculated. On the album, Beyonce addresses Jay Z's speech in which he called out the Grammys for never awarding Beyonce the album of the year despite her having the most Grammy
Grammys in history. About this, Alan said, when Jay-Z got up and said that thing that was part of this campaign, it was before the album had come out or even been announced and she was wearing the blonde wig and a cowboy hat. Alan later shared her thought that Beyonce was coming for that market. Her co-host joked that Alan was working on her own country album, which would be the first country music Alan were to release, to which Alan replied, but I'm not like trying to conquer the country market. I'm here because I've loved country music and always have loved country music. Not saying Beyonce doesn't, but I tell stories in my songs and quite a lot of country music does the same thing. I think it's well suited to what it is that I do. Alan also appeared to have shaded the way Beyonce looks later on in the podcast, so overall fans weren't happy and a Beyonce Lily Allen collab is probably not on the way. Courtney Love is clearly not a Swifty. The whole singer has never been known for mincing her words, but this time it was Taylor Swift who was in her crosshairs. In a recent interview with The Standard, Courtney Love stated that Taylor Swift was not important and uninteresting as an artist. Now that's a pretty remarkable thing to say, considering that you can't go anywhere these days without seeing Taylor Swift's image in some capacity. Her global outreach is currently unmatched, but that just doesn't seem to be cutting it for love. The whole singer also went on to say that she was basically just the Madonna of this generation and accused Taylor of being a safe space for girls. Perhaps Courtney Love was hoping that the biggest pop artist would have a more unique personality, but everything that Swift is doing at the present time seems to be right, so why on earth would she change it? Now on the topic of being unimportant, well that's just plain false. There is clearly no one in the music industry who is currently more important than Taylor Swift. Everything she touches pretty much turns to gold, and she's able to sell out the biggest arenas in the world in a matter of seconds. On top of that, she also brought in a ton of new fans and revenue for the NFL by simply dating Travis Kelsey of the Kansas City Chiefs. Clearly she is very important, but that's just not how Courtney Love seems to view things. Now it's definitely not too surprising to hear Courtney Love compare Taylor Swift with Madonna, but it's not for the reasons you might imagine. Yes, they were both the clear frontrunners in pop music for their respective generations, but Courtney Love has a pretty rough history with Madonna, who she also called out in this crazy interview. Courtney Love simply stated that she doesn't like Madonna and Madonna doesn't like her. Now this likely traces all the way back to 1995, when the pair had a disastrous encounter at the MTV Video Music Awards. Madonna was in the middle of an interview with Kurt Loder when a wild Courtney Love crashed the show and created one of the most bizarre interviews that we've ever seen. Love was acting completely erratic and was asking some very sensitive questions to Madonna, which the latter was clearly not interested in answering. So it's pretty easy to see why these two still don't see eye to eye after so many years. Now maybe that was just bringing back some bad memories for Courtney, but it's a bit of a mystery why she's now comparing her old nemesis to Taylor Swift. Aside from their mainstream popularity, it's pretty tough to say if they really have much in common at all. Maybe Courtney was just in a terrible mood when she gave this interview because Taylor and Madonna were not the only ones who were catching heat from love. After she was finished dissing Taylor Swift and Madonna, she then moved on to Beyonce to give her thoughts on the singer's new album, Cowboy Carter. Courtney didn't really have any good thing to say about anyone in this interview, so it's not too surprising to hear that she didn't like the new album. She just didn't seem to care for Beyonce's attempt at a country record, but she did at least have one good comment about the singer. Courtney said that she appreciated the fact that Beyonce was stepping into a space that is usually reserved for white artists and respected the album's symbolism in a sense. But musically, however, Courtney just really didn't like Beyonce's break into the country space. We can't imagine that Beyonce will be paying much attention to these comments, and it would honestly be surprising if she even gave a response at all. Like every other album Beyonce has ever released, Cowboy Carter is currently trending near the top of the charts. And outside of Courtney Love, the masses really seem to be enjoying her step into a brand new genre. And just to wrap up this bizarre interview, Courtney Love also decided to take a shot at Lana Del Rey. She claimed the singer used to be great, but she has now seemingly lost her touch. After her 2023 cover of John Denver's famous song, Take Me Home Country Road, Courtney Love now claims that the singer should take about seven years off. Del Rey literally just finished performing at Coachella, so it's pretty obvious that she doesn't need to take any time off and her musical talent is still very much alive. But even though she probably won't be listening to any Lana Del Rey music in the near future, Courtney went on to clarify her comments about all the performers she roasted in this interview. While she did say that it was great to see so many female performers succeeding in the music industry, she believes that they are all becoming clones of one another. So this comes just one month after Courtney Love ripped into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for not inducting enough female and black artists into its ranks. She claimed that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony is just an 
and a reminder of just how extraordinary a woman has to be to make it into the old boys club. She stated that the voting process needs to be overhauled and the nominating committee is completely broken. Now, this year's list of inductees include the likes of Missy Elliott and Cindy Lauper, amongst other female artists, but that was overshadowed by a long list of male inductees. Courtney is clearly very passionate about giving a strong platform for female performers, but it's also strange that she would go after some of the top female musicians of this generation. The likes of Taylor Swift and Beyonce seem like absolute guarantees to be inducted into the prestigious Music Hall of Fame at some point down the road, so her new comments are definitely a bit misleading. Maybe she does have their best interests at heart in this scenario, but it's highly likely that some people will take her comments the exact opposite way. With all of that in mind though, we can't forget that Courtney Love has been outspoken for pretty much her entire life and career. She also just recently released an eight part series on BBC Radio 6 Music entitled Courtney Loves Women. The series goes into detail about the special women in Love's life who helped shape her life and career over the years, and she is not afraid to go into detail on some of these stories. She's also stated that she wants the series to redeem some of the women who have been treated so badly by the recording industry over the years. One of the groups she recognized was the all girl band The Runaways, who were tremendously successful during the 1970s. Love stated that this gave her the idea that Hollywood is run by girls in bands, or at least by girls who wanted to sleep with guys in bands. She then went on to state that she was totally wrong, and Hollywood is exactly like the music industry, which was dominated by men. She did not hold back with her opinions on this topic, and it is very clear that she still wants to make a good change to benefit women in the industry. Now, whether or not Taylor Swift or anyone else will respond to these comments is a bit of a mystery. There's a chance that Swift may never even pay attention to these comments, but she's never been one to shy away from expressing her feelings as well. And ironically, this is something that Courtney Love and Taylor Swift have in common, even if they don't want to admit it. We all know that any man who has done Taylor Swift wrong has been publicly blasted in a song over the years, so who's to say that Taylor wouldn't throw Courtney Love's name into a new track? She might not like what Courtney had to say about her importance in the music industry, but she might be interested in her drive for change. Taylor is another big name performer who has been advocating for female musicians over the years, so perhaps her and Courtney could find a common ground in this sense. Keeping that in mind though, still a bit of a strange mystery that Courtney Love would want to tear down a woman who is clearly a role model for many young women around the world. Perhaps she feels that Taylor could do more for her Swifties, but it seems like there is definitely two sides to this very strange coin. No matter how you see this scenario, it seems pretty clear that Courtney Love wants to see change in the industry. She is not afraid to say exactly what she thinks about anyone, even if her comments don't sit well with many people around the world. And in this case, it seems like she believes that Taylor Swift, Madonna, Beyonce, and Lana Del Rey all have one thing in common. They are all apparently cliches who should just come up with something more interesting. But considering all the success that they have all enjoyed, maybe they'd be better off just ignoring Love's comments altogether. Courtney has no problem voicing her opinion about major performers in the industry, but it'll be interesting to hear if she has any solutions for them. It's quite obvious that she would like to see big names like Taylor Swift make a change, but it's a bit of a mystery how they would do that. Courtney has been on record saying that some of her favorite female artists include Debbie Harry, Patti Smith, Nina Simone, and PJ Harvey. Perhaps she would rather see the big names of today perform like her favorites, but that would go against her point of everyone being a copy of one another. Needless to say though, a roundtable discussion between Courtney Love and all the woman she named in this interview with The Standard would definitely be must-see TV. That's all we have for now, but we'll definitely have to keep an eye on some of the big names that were called out in this interview. It'll be really interesting to see if any of them take the time to address Courtney Love's comments, or if they just dismiss them as white noise. Facing criticism is nothing new for a big name performer in the entertainment industry, but how they respond to it is what really makes the difference. Coachella performances this year have been a mess across the board. We'll get to the big one at the end, but Grimes is unfortunately another victim of this. Grimes produces music in the lo-fi, R&B, and dance pop genres. Great choice for the festival. The tech for the festival didn't agree, I guess. Some of the DJ tracks were double the speed among other random tech difficulties happening. It also apparently got so bad that Grimes screamed and cursed out of frustration. She had to stop the set multiple times, explain to the crowd in real time that she was having trouble mixing the songs because all the tracks were double the tempo. Overall, it sounds like a nightmare for the artist. The set actually got cut short because everything was going so wrong and Grimes left the stage in the middle of one of her songs. She later apologized for the disaster on her ex account, sharing that the reason the songs were messed up was because she had, in her words, outsourced essential things like record blocks, 
BPMs and letting someone else organize the tracks on the SD card, etc. So it seems like someone else caused the speedy tracks. To add more context, Grimes went on to write, the CDJs were showing me BPMs like 370, so I couldn't even mix manually by ear, and the front monitors were off, so it was literally sonic chaos on my end, trying to guess how stuff was sounding for you guys. So it seems like the set truly was a hopeless case as Grimes couldn't even hear what was happening. Luckily, she has said that she will fix everything herself in time for her next performance, but this was surely something out of a nightmare. Tyler, the creator, is known for his animated stage presence and out-of-pocket remarks, never shying away from anything, not even at America's Biggest Music Festival. This edition was Tyler, the creator, addressing a friend's past affections for him. The friend was Jared Carmichael. Jared has recently revealed he used to have a crush on Tyler and that Tyler didn't reciprocate the feelings. Tyler acknowledged this on the Coachella stage, saying, I'm guessing y'all got TikTok and probably seen my homie on camera. I looked terrible. So it seems even long after everything went down, Tyler, the creator, is still not into it. Jared did express in an interview with Esquire that he appreciated that Tyler was willing to have a conversation with him about his crush in the first place. Who knows if he expected this to be brought up on such a big stage, though. Nelly Furtado has left it all on the stage, including her own red stuff. The singer of hits like Eat Your Man was giving an incredible and energetic performance, and it seems that was her literal downfall. She had a nasty fall on stage, though she did get up and finished the set with plenty of energy. She later posted a photo of a pretty busted up finger with some lines of red running down the side. It looked pretty painful, so it definitely speaks to her professionalism and love for her work as she was able to just get back up with something so serious. She did smile big for the photo, writing in the caption, left it all on the stage. She certainly did. One interview went south almost as quick as it started. Singer, songwriter, and actress Tayana Taylor is known for films like A Thousand and One and songs like Gonna Love Me, and now storming out of interviews. The singer was being interviewed, but apparently didn't appreciate the line of questioning. She started to express frustration and then ultimately stormed out. It was an intense moment, tensions were high, the interviewer looked on the verge of tears, the poor girl. Sounds pretty serious, right? Well, turns out it was all a prank. Taylor is just as funny as she is talented, it seems. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey make headlines wherever they go, even if they aren't doing anything. In this case, all the superstars did was watch Taylor's friend and Karma collaborator Coachella's performance. Ice Spice was performing all her hits and doing a great job. She even positively called out Taylor at one point saying, shout out to Taylor, mother effing Swift. The statement being met with cheers from the audience. Taylor and Travis really were just minding their business, supporting Taylor's friend, dancing with each other, and yet phones that should have been pointed towards the stage were directed at Taylor. It must be so awkward knowing that just your presence is distracting from your friend's performance. It must also feel awkward just having a bunch of phone cameras filming you flash on. Yet the international superstar handled it well, keeping her eyes on the stage and supporting her friend. Let's spice things up. Jojo Siwa's radical shift has been the internet's favorite topic for the past couple weeks. In case you missed it or you have been on a month long vacation with no internet access, Jojo Siwa has gone from rainbow rhinestones to black rhinestones. She is undergoing a shift in her brand. She wants to be seen as more adult to match her new song, Karma. The opening lyrics of the song, I was a bad girl, didn't fit with Jojo's old persona, her words, and so she needed to update her look to sing the song. The most recognizable look from this new era of Jojo would have to be the look she wore to the iHeartRadio Awards 2024 that was also the costume from her Karma music video. This is the one where she looks like she's going on tour with Kiss. Everyone's been trolling her for the better part of a week. She claims she's made the most major image shift of her generation, but many people online are pointing out that she just went from color sparkles to black sparkles and that the core of what people know Jojo's brand to be is still the same. Jojo did an interview in the Karma Fit while at the iHeart Awards and it went viral very fast. It is being parodied on all corners of the internet. Jojo was asked who her dream guest would be on her podcast, to which she responded, let's spice things up, one of my exes. The internet took the outfit and the comment and the voice and ran with it and there is a high chance that if you've scrolled your For You page in the last week, you have been hit with this embarrassing moment. Barbie was a mega hit, the message of the film resounding with women and men all over the world, but Joe 
McCoy seemed to have missed the message entirely if his embarrassing Golden Globes joke is any indicator. One of the many messages in the Barbie movie was about Barbie being more than a doll, more than just a woman's body parts. That seemed to have gone right over Joe's head. Last summer was the summer of Barbenheimer. Barbie and Oppenheimer, both amazing films, were coming out at the same time, and then because of that, they were pit against each other and have been ever since. Joe Coy continued this trend, but in a more disrespectful way. He praised the source material from Oppenheimer, talking about how it was a Pulitzer Prize winning book, but his comments about Barbie, based on a doll with big boobs. That's it. Clearly patronizing the success of the film that so many people have expressed meant something to them and spoke accurately of the issues women and men face in society. The joke fell so flat you could feel the awkward tension from the comfort of your living room. An uninterested crowd is a performer's worst nightmare. Blur, unfortunately, got to experience that at Coachella this weekend. The English rock band were performing their many hits at the festival, and yet the crowd seemed like they would rather be anywhere else. The band apparently tried engaging with the crowd multiple times, tried to bring up the energy, but no one was into it. Sometimes they were even met with silence. At one point, it got to be too much, and the lead singer, Damon Albarn, addressed the bad vibes, saying, you're never seeing us again, so you might as well effing sing it. I imagine the feeling of being in that crowd would have been like getting scolded by a teacher. I'm glad I wasn't there. Fans of the band online were quick to comment on the situation, one fan writing, I'm convinced Coachella has the worst vibes in people possible. It's blur, show some respect. Others pointing out that maybe the audience was younger and not as familiar with the pop band as they were not from America. Still, if you're going to see a band, even if you don't know them that well, if they're trying to bring up the energy, give them something. Opening monologues seem to be a tough thing to put together. Shortly after the failed Golden Globes opening, we got Jimmy Kimmel's Oscar disaster. Not everything was bad, and we will get to that in a second, but there were a couple jokes in there that were the cutest. One that stands out was when Kimmel joked about Robert Downey Jr.'s past substance issues, something that our DJ has been very clear he doesn't like talking about his face after like Taylor's didn't look too pleased. There was also a moment where Kimmel made a joke about poor things that Emma Stone looked like she didn't appreciate. So yes, Jimmy Kimmel has had his share of fails in that opening piece. However, he did make a point with one of his jokes. Director of Barbie, Greta Gerwig, did not get a nomination this year at the Oscars, something that many people believe was a massive snub. Kimmel acknowledged this in the monologue saying, now Barbie is a feminist icon thanks to Greta Gerwig who many believe deserved to be nominated for Best Director. The Oscars audience then started clapping in agreement, but then Jimmy caught them all with his next remark, saying, You're the ones who didn't vote for her, by the way. Don't act like you had nothing to do with this. You did this. He's right. Most of the people in that audience were the people that voted. It's their fault Greta was snubbed. So why were they acting like they were supporting her when they caused the problem? Most recent moment is fitting right in the last spot on this list, Lana Del Rey's Coachella set. This is not to say that Lana did a bad job, she was giving. It's just the microphone was not, it kept cutting out. Lana is known for having a powerful yet soft voice. Coachella is outside, a good mic is important in this situation. Unfortunately, Lana did not have that. She had to do sound checks with the audience, asking if they could even hear her. Stopping and starting constantly did have an effect on the energy of the set, which was unfortunate, considering she started out so strong coming in on the back of a motorbike. Overall, it was a tragic day in Coachella history. There was a bright spot though. Lana brought out another artist for her headlining performance, a great pick too, they have similar styles, Billie Eilish. Merch great for Eilish too, more exposure, especially with the new music coming out soon. Anya Taylor-Joy, as the famous Back to Black singer, would have been iconic, but it was never meant to be. Just to talk about the elephant in the room with this one, the two women do not look alike at all. Makeup can only go so far, right? But they both have very distinct looks, which brings them a bit closer together in my opinion. Anya Taylor-Joy is an incredible actor actress and has been in the game for a while. She has gathered quite the impressive resume with The Queen's Gambit, The Menu, Emma, and Last Night in Soho on there. Her role in Last Night in Soho was all about a singer caught in bad circumstances. Very different circumstances, but still, the point is, Joy has played a similar role and done a very good job. Joy does have an incredible voice and has sung Winehouse a few times in interviews and karaoke clips. Her choosing the songs shows she has an appreciation for the work and well just likes it. Both Joy and Winehouse grew up in London, so Joy already has the accent. Esme Creed Miles is an up and coming actress that may not be a big name now, but
but surely will. She, like Winehouse, is English, born in the UK. Miles has starred in shows like The Doll Factory and Hannah. Though not known for her vocal abilities, there are many videos online of Miles singing and strumming the guitar. Esme does have very striking blue eyes, so if she were to have been selected for the role, she probably would have had to wear brown contacts. Miles is still in the beginning of her career, though she did not land the role in Back to Black, it will be interesting to see where her career goes. Lucy Boynton is well versed in the world of biopics. She would have been a great choice for Back to Black. Lucy has also starred in media that aren't biopics like Netflix's Politician, but just to list all the biopic roles she has done, just to give you a better picture of where I'm coming from with this choice, she played Marie Antoinette in Chevalier, 10 out of 10 movie, would recommend. Mary Austin in Bohemian Rhapsody, 11 out of 10 movie, would recommend. And in the biopic about the writer of Catcher in the Rye, Rebel in the Rye, she played Claire Douglas, again, 10 out of 10 movie, would recommend. She is like the biopic queen. Lucy was born in NYC, but grew up in London. She describes herself as painfully British, so taking on a British star like Amy Winehouse definitely seems doable for her, even though that is not what happened. With her track record though, I wouldn't be surprised if a different biopic makes her resume later. Ray may be more of a singer than an actress, but many singers have seamlessly transitioned to the screen and she could have been another great example. She has said that she admires Amy Winehouse and has been compared to Winehouse throughout her career, and it's not hard to see why. Both artists are from London and rose to fame after releasing their debut albums. She actually just won Album of the Year at the 2024 Brit Awards for her debut album. Ray performed at the award show and many fans took to social media to express how much she reminded them of Winehouse, many writing that she should have been the one to play her in the biopic. The two do look alike in style, she seems to have drawn some aesthetic inspo from Winehouse, rocking the big eyeliner wings and dark hair. Maya Hawk would have been a bold choice to portray Winehouse. Hawk shot to fame after portraying Robin in the Netflix hit show Stranger Things and has now given captivating performances in a variety of other critically acclaimed shows and films. Hawk is from the US, whereas Winehouse is from the UK, so they are different in that sense. But Hawk has shown that she is an acting force to be reckoned with, so I'm sure she would have done a great job either way. What Winehouse and Hawk do have in common though is that they are both singers. Hawk has released three albums over the past five years, so she would have had a good understanding of that aspect of Amy's life and the work it takes to create. Plus, Hawk would have been around the same age Winehouse was when they both released their second albums. Though she didn't star in this biopic, she got that credit on her resume elsewhere, portraying American novelist Flannery O'Connor in the 2023 film Wildcat, which premiered right here in Toronto at the Toronto International Film Festival and was widely praised. Emma Mackey is frequently compared to Margot Robbie, but a bit of black hair dye and some big black eyeliner, and she starts resembling the back to black singer. You might recognize Mackie from some hit Netflix TV shows and movies like Barbie. Mackie has shown off her musical skills online, clips of the actress singing have gone viral on TikTok, and if you check the comments, people have nothing but good things to say about the star. Like Amy, Emma spent a lot of time in London. She was born in France, but moved to London for university. She has ties there because her mother is British. Sophie Turner might have seemed like an unlikely choice, but not completely unsurprising. Sophie Turner made a name for herself on the hit TV show Game of Thrones, playing Sansa Stark, but someone had to discover the raw talent that is Turner and give her that big shot. That person was Nina Gold, casting director for Game of Thrones and now the casting director for Back to Black. Sophie, like Winehouse, was born in the UK. Though Turner is mainly known for having red or blonde hair, she does look striking with black hair in fan edits and at one time she was Morticia Adams for Halloween. For anyone worried about her singing abilities, Turner has proven she can sing just as well as she can act in segments on The Late Late Show though she has admitted preferring rapping to singing. So she did have a lot going for her, maybe Nina Gold had Turner in the back of her mind while casting, but as we know now, the part did not go to Turner. Lauren Harege might not be an actress, but you cannot deny the singer's resemblance to the late Back to Black star. Many fans of the former Fifth Harmony star have been saying for years that Lauren and Amy look alike, and that Lauren should be considered for the role if they ever make an Amy biopic. Well that time has come, 
and gone, and Lauren was not selected. Lauren did get the chance to portray Winehouse on the popular TV show Lip Sync Battle in 2018. She lip synced along to Winehouse's Rehab, dressed as the singer. Many people online really started seeing her as the star when this came out, but looks aren't everything when it comes to biopics. The casting director for the film, Nina Gold, has commented on her casting process, saying that sometimes it's not so much about finding someone that looks like the character, and more about finding someone that captures the essence of the person. Fans online did hilariously come to the defense of Lauren's acting abilities, one writing, she was literally acting like she's happy 24-7 during all that Fifth Harmony hectic drama, The Method Actress. What is interesting to note, so Lauren went on the Zach Sang show and revealed that her team actually did receive calls about her playing Amy, but casting really wanted someone who was authentically British, Lauren explained. So her being American may have actually cost her the part. Millie Bobby Brown has expressed interest in playing Amy Winehouse in the past. A then 16 year old Millie sat down for an interview with Netflix Latino America and dropped that she would be interested in taking on the role of Winehouse should a biopic get made as she loves her music. In the interview, Brown said, Amy Winehouse I personally think is like an icon to R&B, blues and basically the whole culture of music. I just love her music and I was really impacted by her whole story and so I always say that I would love to play her. Hey, with fan edited images of Millie with black hair found online, she kind of looks like her. Millie has showcased her love for Winehouse's music, performing different variations of songs on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon and even posting videos of covers on her social media. Millie has been a fan for years. While on The Tonight Show, Jimmy Fallon played a clip of a very young Brown performing Valerie for the camera. Though Bobby Brown is British like Amy, which is something that they were looking for, she might have lost the role for a different reason. Winehouse's father, Mitch, revealed in an interview with Paul Dannon that the casting team was looking for an unknown actress. He said they were searching for an unknown actress, ideally a Jewish girl from North or East London who looks a bit like Amy and talks like Amy. Millie Bobby Brown was definitely not an unknown actress, so her undeniable star power may have been the reason she lost out on the role in the end. Lady Gaga was a name thrown into the mix by fans on social media. It's not totally random. The singer turned actress has actually expressed interest in Amy Winehouse as a person and the possibility of playing her. Back in 2011, Lady Gaga sat down for an interview with Omaha 94.1, a US radio station. This was just after Winehouse had passed. Gaga had been asked about it and replied with, it's really devastating and I think it's a lesson to the world. Don't kill the superstar, take care of her, take care of her soul. At this point, Gaga was a very, very famous woman at age 25, a household name, but that wasn't always the case of course. When Winehouse was rising to fame, no one even knew who Lady Gaga was, something Gaga is aware of and also commented on. She said, I was nobody when she was first coming out. I have really dark hair and all the time on the street people would go, Amy, and they would go back to black. They'd scream at me. So it seems like people have been comparing the physical features of Gaga and Winehouse for over a decade now. At that point in time, Gaga had yet to step into the film world, but an inside source claimed that she had wanted to and that she believed playing Amy Winehouse would be an amazing introduction. Obviously, we know now that that didn't happen. Gaga's film debut was A Star Is Born, but she was on the miniseries American Horror Story Hotel before that. Even back in 2011, before either of those projects, there is evidence to support that Gaga could have handled the role. Not only did the two stars physically resemble each other, they were both known for their big personalities and unique voices, plus Gaga actually grew up acting. Gaga wasn't the choice this time around, but maybe in another life. If you didn't know, it's been announced that OJ Simpson has passed away at the age of 76. He was battling cancer and even recently posted a video claiming to be in better health, but this is ultimately what resulted in his death. Now he was a former running back who spent 11 seasons in the NFL, playing only for the Buffalo Bills and San Francisco 49ers. But there was so much more to this athlete than anyone could have seen. So let's jump into our list of the dark secrets OJ Simpson took to the grave. Now the biggest question people have on their mind is, did he do it? On the night of June 12, 1994, OJ's ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman were stabbed to death outside her condominium in Los Los Angeles. Now, OJ Simpson quickly became the prime suspect. OJ was formally arranged on July 22, 1994, entering a plea of not guilty. The trial began on January 24, 1995. The Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, led by Marcia Clark and Christopher Darden, emphasized that OJ physically mistreated Nicole prior to and 
after The Simpsons 1992 divorce as a motive. Robert Kardashian, who was also Simpsons longtime friend, defended him in court and Johnny Cochran later became the defense team's lead attorney. Now, The Simpson defense was based largely on the grounds that evidence had been mishandled and that many members of the Los Angeles Police Department were racist, particularly Mark Frillman, a detective who allegedly found a bloody leather glove at Simpson's home. The defense team argued that the glove could not have been OJ's because it appeared too small for his hand when he tried it on in the courtroom. In addition to the glove, the defense claimed that other important evidence had been planted by the police to frame him. Now, During the trial, which lasted more than 8 months, some 150 witnesses testified, though OJ did not take the stand. On October 2, 1995, the jury finally began deliberating and reached a verdict in less than 4 hours. On October 3rd, OJ was found not guilty of the deaths of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. But that doesn't mean he got off the hook. Although he was acquitted in the criminal case, he was also sued by the victim's families for wrongful death, and the civil trial began in October 1996. Less than four months later, that jury found him responsible for the deaths of Nicole and Ronald and awarded their families $33.5 million in charges. Now, that to me just screams that he did it. Now we have why he spoke to the police. After OJ was told about the deaths, he arrived at his home in the Brentwood section of Los Angeles as LAPD officers were executing a search warrant. After speaking with detectives, OJ agreed to travel with detectives to Parker Center to be formally interviewed. OJ traveled to Parker Center in a car with detectives while his lawyer followed in a separate vehicle. Now, against the advice of his attorney, OJ agreed to be interviewed by the LAPD detectives without a lawyer present. Now, in the audio, it appears that he has no concern for Nicole or how she's died, and only has emotion once the police start insinuating that OJ was responsible for the crime. And this leads us to, and is probably why he had the car chase. Now, okay, calling it a car chase is a little far fetched because he was only going 35 miles per hour and was being followed by helicopters, TV crews, and pretty much the entirety of the LAPD. Now, when OJ failed to turn himself in, an all points bulletin was issued for his arrest. By the morning of June 17, 1974, police arrived to arrest OJ at the home of his friend and lawyer, Robert Kardashian, but they found that OJ had slipped out the back door with his former college and Buffalo Bills teammate, Al Cowlings. Now, the two men then drove off in Al's white Ford Bronco, and after a news conference, the LAPD officially declared the former football star a fugitive, where his lawyer, Howard Shapiro, announced that OJ was so distraught he might take his own life. Then around 7 p.m., police located the white Bronco by tracing calls made from OJ's cell phone, where he was reported to be in the back seat of the vehicle. Vehicles from the LAPD and California Highway Patrol pursued the Bronco for about an hour as it traveled at some 35 miles per hour along the I-405. Finally, the Bronco pulled into the driveway of OJ's Brentwood home, and he emerged from the car close to 9 p.m. and was immediately arrested and booked. Then there's the interviews. You'd think that after the trial, OJ would try to lay low as all eyes were on him as his life was full of scandals. Now, If not for himself, you'd think he'd do it for his children, Sidney Brooke and Justin Ryan, but that's not the route that he chose to go. That was made clear during an interview in 1998 with Ruby Wax. By allowing himself to be interviewed for hours, he opened himself up to have every move that he made analyzed by experts and more importantly, by the public. And with the twists and turns, that the interview took, many wondered what OJ was trying to accomplish by agreeing to speak about the deaths. Now, to make things worse though, at the end of the interview, he pulled a prank which was just downright weird, disturbing, and proved to me, at least, that he was not sound of mind. Now, Ruby uses humor as one of the ways to help disarm celebrities and make them more comfortable, so Ruby was going to do a bit about being set up and not knowing who was coming to the door. And while she knew that it would be OJ, there was no preparing her for the surprise Surprise that OJ said he had as she opened the door. As she opened the door, OJ had a banana in his hand and he pretended to stab Ruby with it, making horror movie stabbing sounds to go along with it. I think it was his idea of a joke, Ruby explained. Now, why on earth would he think that was funny? He was literally accused of stabbing two people to death. On what planet would something like that be funny? Now, it said that producers were so disturbed by what they saw that they almost did not air the interview. But because Simpson had not been found guilty, they allowed the interview to air in its entirety, which honestly, I don't blame them for because what the heck. 
And finally, the most outlandish question of them all, is he Khloe Kardashian's father? Now, OJ was represented by his friend Robert Kardashian and was quite close to the Kardashian family. Many people believe that he and Chris had an affair, and in general, there has been intense scrutiny over his relationship with Chris, and some fans on social media have been vocal with their theories that they welcome Khloe together, suggesting she's not Robert's daughter. Now, the rumors stem from the fact that Khloe doesn't strongly resemble Chris, the late Robert, her siblings, or or her half siblings. Now, Chris Jenner has admitted to cheating during her marriage to Robert, which also fuels the fire. Now, Chris and OJ have separately spoken out against the rumors many times over the years and fiercely denied odd claims that they secretly reunited in the 90s to have in a hot tub. In 2017, the momager burst into tears in an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, fuming that the rumors had kept up for decades. They printed a story I was sleeping with OJ. After 25 years, you'd think it just wouldn't be a thing, she sobbed to Chloe. Then, two years later, OJ shared a video on Father's Day, vowing that he was never interested in Chris in a romantic sense, while calling out the renewed theories that he was Chloe's father. Never, and I want to stress this, never in any way, shape, or form have I ever had any interest in Chris romantic or he said the time. I don't know though. I kind of believe the theory. I mean, what do you think? Well, that's all for our list of the dark secrets OJ Simpson took to the grave. It seems like we may never know the truth about these secrets, and that's just something as a society that we'll have to accept. Starting off, we have Daphne Joy. Now, after Diddy's place got raided, rapper 50 Cent, real name Curtis Jackson III, responded on Twitter saying, Now it's not Diddy do it, it's Diddy done. They don't come like that unless they got a case. Now, while 50 Cent was not named in the lawsuit against Combs, a woman identified as Daphne Joy, who shares a child with 50 Cent, was named in the suit. In a statement posted on Instagram, Joy responded to 50 Cent saying, Everything is a joke until our safety is compromised which is happening right now. Now, Joy went on to accuse 50 Cent of physically mistreating her and said, you have broken our hearts for the last and final time. Next up is Stevie J. In addition to Joy, another celebrity named in the suit, Stevie J, Stephen Aaron Jordan, also responded to 50 Cent on social media. Stevie J hit back at 50 Cent on Instagram and said, since it's entertainment, let me beat the sh out of you on TV or something. Now, it's alleged that the Grammy winner Stevie J, Diddy's longtime collaborator, recruited workers and participated in Combs' freak-offs in his amended complaint filed in the U.S. District Court in the Southern District of New York, though it does not name Stevie J as a defendant. Now, Diddy is accused of instructing Stevie J to teach him the type of workers to solicit and the way to solicit them. It's alleged that Stevie J sent threatening messages when the plaintiff, Rodney Jones, publicly asked Combs to pay him for his work on Combs' The Love Album. The complaint also says that Combs used his connection to Stevie J, Rodney's idol, to pressure Rodney into being intimate. I've never seen my man do anything foul like they talking about. I've never seen it. I've known him for 29 years, Stevie J told TMZ earlier this month. Moving on to Young Miami. Young Miami, a member of City Girls, is mentioned in Jones's amended complaint filed in the U.S. District Court of the Southern District of New York. Now, she is not a defendant, nor is she accused of misconduct. She is listed as being a part of Combs' operation and accused of bringing Diddy illegal substances on a private jet. The complaint says she was retained on a monthly stipend as one of Combs' sex workers, and it also alleges that her cousin, named as Jane Doe One, took advantage of Rodney. Now, since the raid, she has shared numerous posts on social media, but many of the posts are promoting a new song that she is releasing. Erin Hall, an R&B singer who was part of the group Guy, was named as a defendant in a complaint filed against Diddy last November in the New York Supreme Court ahead of the expiration date for New York's Adult Survivors Act, which provide a one-year window in which people could bring cases of SA outside the typical statute of limitations. The plaintiff, who is named Lisa Gardner, accuses Combs and Aaron Hall of essaying her and her friend in Aaron's apartment after a music industry event by MCA Records in 1990. She says Combs coerced her into being intimate with him and that afterward, Aaron barged into the room, pinned her down, and forced her to be intimate with him too. The plaintiff also alleges that Combs found her at her home and choked her until she passed out, as he was worried his girlfriend would find out about the incident, the complaint says. Now let's talk about Cuba Gooding 
Downing Jr. An amended complaint filed in March in the U.S. District Court of Southern District, New York by Rodney Jones lists Cuba Gooding Jr. as a defendant. Now, Rodney accuses Cuba of harassment and SA. Specifically, Rodney accuses Combs of grooming him to pass him off to Cuba. Now, the two were left alone in a makeshift studio on a yacht rented by Combs, according to the complaint. There, Gooding began inappropriately touching Rodney. Now, it's to be known that the actor previously pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor count of forcibly touching, so this incident being real isn't shocking. Now we have Lucian Grange. The CEO of Universal Music Group and father-in-law to Sophia Ritchie, Lucian Grange is also listed as a defendant in Rodney's amended complaint. He's accused of aiding and abetting Combs, specifically in racketeering and trafficking. Rodney says that as CEO, Lucian had a duty to ensure the financial support they provided to Sean Combs and Love Records was not being used for drugs and laced alcohol. Now, attorneys for Grange have filed a motion to dismiss, in which they call the accusations offensively false. In a sworn statement to the court, Grange called the accusations completely untrue and absurd, and said he plans to pursue both plaintiffs and his counsel for having made such false accusations. Now, Grange also points to the fact that he is the CEO of a multinational public company, and that he's not involved in day-to-day -day operation of the company's thousands of agreements. Now, in a statement to Business Insider, Grange's attorney, Donald S. Zark, called the complaint offensively reckless. The plaintiff has now attempted to amend his claims against Sir Lucian, removing the original set of outrageous falsehoods related to Sir Lucian, replacing them with wholly contradictory new falsehoods that are equally absurd, he said. Not only will we demonstrate the offensive falsity of these claims, but we will seek recovery of every penny of cost and damage caused by their assertion. Moving on to Justin Dior Combs. Justin Dior Combs, Diddy's 30-year-old son, is a defendant and Rod Rodney's amended complaint. In a wide range list of allegations, Rodney accuses Justin Combs of soliciting as well as engaging in freak offs. He also says the younger and older Combs were the only two people present in the room when G, a friend of his, was shot at a recording studio, implying that one of them shot G. Now, Justin Combs was at Diddy's Los Angeles home when it was raided by feds and was seen handcuffed on the lawn outside, though he was not arrested. Justin Combs' lawyer said that the complaint was utterly bonkers on his radio show Beyond the Legal Limit. It's clearly written in an effort to get as much publicity as possible, not only for the case, but for the lawyer whose name I don't even remember, literally some maniac, he said. Then there's Prince Harry. Now, Diddy is said to have drawn guests to his infamous parties through his VIP associations with celebrities, such as famous athletes, political figures, artists, musicians, and international dignitaries like British royal Prince Harry, according to the legal notice. Now, there's no suggestion of any wrongdoing by the prince, and his name is only mentioned once in the documents as an example of a well known celebrity. A Associate of Combs. Now, both Harry and his brother Prince William were pictured with Combs and Kanye West in 2007 after the musicians performed in the concert for Diana at Wembley Stadium. So, to reiterate, Harry has not been accused of anything. Next up are the anonymous celebrities. While there are anonymous or redacted celebrities named in the suit, it's not too difficult to figure out who they are. While Chris Brown isn't named specifically in court documents, he's referenced as one of two redacted figures, redacted on R&B singer, who is specifically alleged to have been in Mr. Combs' Los Angeles home consorting with girls. Now, another clue that points to it being Chris is the footnote at the bottom of the same page, which reads, a Grammy Award-winning R&B singer who had trouble with law enforcement after assaulting a ball gym billionaire. Then, like Chris, while Meek Mill wasn't named specifically in court documents, he's referenced as one of the two redacted, redacted rapper figures, who was specifically and allegedly in Mr. Combs' Los Angeles home consorting with girls. Now, another clue that points to it being Meek is in the footnote at the bottom of the same page, which reads, he is a Philadelphia rapper who dated Nicki Minaj. And lastly, we have Bishop T.D. Jake. While the bishop was not alleged to have done anything illegal per court documents, he was named as one of the people Diddy allegedly intended to leverage a relationship with in order to soften the impact on his public image of Casey Venture's lawsuit. Now, Diddy and the bishop joined forces back in 2021 for an ongoing religious series entitled Kingdom Culture with T.D. Jakes. In 2022, the two were spotted together in photographs at Diddy's 53rd birthday party, which prompted an outcry and criticism on social media about the relationship between religious leaders and music figures. In late 2023, the bishop would come under fire again on social media after an unfounded report claimed that he was engaging in 
activity with men at Diddy's parties. Now, he addressed the Diddy rumors once in a December 2022 comment from his representatives and again during a Christmas Eve sermon, during which he let folks know that they can log off the online broadcast of the service if they came to hear him address a lie. 